please. Now you can answer when you want. Awesome. And uh, just want to quickly check. You can see my screen. You can hear me my, all right. Yes, everything is perfect. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Hello, guys. Uh, my name is Chris Kim. I'm a developer advocate for Algorand. My job is to basically make you guys a professional blockchain uh, developer on Algorand. So before I start talking about Beaker, um, uh, Stefano gave a quick intro to Beaker beforehand, but um, a quick story. So I joined Algorand as a summer intern last year, and and I remember being completely overwhelmed. Uh, my manager asked me to build a simple application using PyTeal in the Python Algorand SDK, and um, I have a Python background, so I thought I can do this. And, and I spent hours digging through the developer portal, reading articles and all that, but um, it was nothing like what I've done before. And, and yes, PyTeal and the Python Algorithm SDK is similar to Python. It was very unfamiliar and, and, and overwhelming for me. So PyTeal and the Algorand SDK, they're, they're amazing. Uh, I'm not saying they're bad. They, they allow you to build complex, cost-efficient, and fast uh, smart contracts on the Algorand blockchain. But for those just starting off blockchain development or who just came to Algorand and starting their learning journey on Algorand, uh, they, can be, they can feel a bit unfamiliar, complex, and overall overwhelming due to all of the moving parts that you have to manage while you're building your smart contract. Well, that's why I'm here today. I wanna to introduce you guys to a framework that will hopefully upgrade your blockchain ex uh, development experience on Algorand and um, help you to focus on creating value and innovating on the Algorand blockchain. So before I start talking about Beaker, I want to quickly talk about what an Algorand DAP architecture looks like. The reason why I want to cover this is because uh, I remember when I first started learning blockchain development, I was confused on, okay, so I know what smart contract is and I know how to build it, but what does that mean? Like, where does that fit in in the, in the scale of a complete uh, application? So I just want to quickly cover that. So this is a typical Web2 app architecture that we are, are familiar with. We have the front end where the users interact with their application. We have the web server that handles all of the API calls and the interaction between the front end and the database. And then we have the database um, that stores all the relevant data that you need for your application. Very simple and very familiar. Well, this is what an Algorand DAP architecture looks like. We still have the same three components, the front end, the web server, and the database. And all we add on to that is the algorithm blockchain. And on the algorithm blockchain, we deploy what's called a smart contract, which is a logic program that you define that uh, contains logic on okay, when to do certain things when you're interacting with the algorithm blockchain. And you interact with a smart contract using the algorithm SDK, either directly from the front end or through the web server. Well, today, when I talk about Beaker, it's gonna ha uh, have something to do with these two things, the Algorand SDK and the smart contract written with PyTeal. All right, now let's get to the fun part. Let's talk about Beaker, the way that development should be. Beaker is a Python smart contract framework. It improves code organization when you're writing smart contracts with PyTeal. It makes deployment and interaction uh, with your smart contract using the Algorand SDK much simpler and easier. It also provides tooling for uh, debugging and testing your code. So in short, it handles all the heavy lifting for you and it abstracts away the complexity um, so that it becomes very familiar and very easy to build your application on, on, on Algorand. So to showcase the power of Beaker, I wanna do a quick comparison of a simple calculator app that lets you add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Um, we're gonna see some code examples of the simple calculator app written in PyTeal and also in Beaker. And let's see what that looks like. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at some code. 
first, let's look at the calculator app written with bear PyTeal. Um, this is this should look familiar because of the uh, Stefano's example of AlgoBank. Um, so this is an ARC4 ABI compliant smart contract with, written with PyTeal. So here I'm just defining a simple expression that checks whether the transaction uh, sender is the creator of the smart contract. And down here, I'm defining the router class. Um, this router class is basically defining um, what happens based on different types of on-complete application calls um, from the front end. So here I'm naming the contract calculator and inside of the bear call actions, I'm defining what happens based on the different on-complete action calls. Uh, so here, um, if it's a create transaction, then we approve it. And then if it's an update or delete on complete transaction calls, uh, application calls, then we check whether the transaction sender is the smart contract creator. And if that's the case, we approve the transaction. If not, we reject it. And here, if the transaction is a clear state application call, then we never approve it and it always, always rejects. Okay, finally here, we have the four uh, the methods that handles the functionality of the calculator. We have the add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Uh, here, these are the way they're defined. It takes in, for, let's take a look at the add method. It takes in two arguments, A and B. They're both UN64 type, and it outputs a, a UN64 type. And it returns by setting the output as A plus B. And you get the values by doing a.get and b.get. Very simple. Um, and all of these methods has the decorator router dot method. This is what connects these methods to the router class that we defined above. And this is how um, the ABI knows how to interact and call um, this, these methods, what arguments it takes in, and what output um, value it does. And down here, I'm using the router.compile program to get the approval teal program, clear teal program, and the contract ABI JSON file. And then I'm, I'm writing that to the file system so that I can use it later on when I'm writing the SDK code to interact with this calculator app. Perfect. So just want to uh, talk about this quickly. Um, this is, yes, it looks very simple, but if you're just coming into Algorin, uh, smart contract development, this router class is very new and it's very unfamiliar and, 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 and sometimes people will not really understand, okay, what does this router do and how does, how does everything work? So it's very unfamiliar for, for those just starting off. Okay, so let's go into the SDK code where we deploy the smart contract to the blockchain and, um, and interact with it. So here I'm importing in uh, 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 modules from the Algorand SDK uh, package. And here I'm importing this get accounts method from Sandbox. Now this is a separate file that I have to manually create. And this get accounts function is something that I wrote uh, manually. And what this is doing is, is, is automatically detecting your Sandbox environment and you're getting the accounts that are live on, on Sandbox for to use for your testing and deploying. Okay, before we start interacting, we need to define some helper methods so that we can um, deploy and interact with the smart contract. First, I'm going to define the create app method here, um, which takes in a bunch of arguments, the client, sender, private key, approval uh, and clear program, and the global and local schemas. And basically what this, uh, function is doing is that it's creating an application to create transaction. Um, then, it's, and we're going to sign that transaction, send the transaction to the blockchain, and wait for confirmation so that we know that it's in the blockchain. It was executed, and then we display the result and return the app, a deployed app ID. Another helper function here uh, is a compile program. It takes in the source code, and then we compile it down so that we can. Uh, um, and we can get the uh, approval and teal program um, that we can use for the create app um, function up here. Okay, uh, more setting up to do. We need to set up the cl LOD client with the URL and the, uh, the client token. Then we get, we use the manually defined get accounts method to get the uh, account from sandbox to use for testing. 
Here, going, we're going to read in the approval and clear teal program from the file system that we wrote before, so over here. And then we're going to compile them using the compile program helper method that we defined above to get the approval and clear program. Then we're going to declare the application state storages. So with Algorand smart contracts, before you deploy them, you have to define um, how many state storages that the smart contract has. So that's what we're doing here. And then we're using that to define the global and local schema. Then finally, we're gonna deploy the application by using the create app helper function. And then we take in all of the um, arguments that we defined above and we get the app ID. Okay, now we're gonna read in the contract.json ABI file so that we can start interacting with the smart contract. And I'm gonna assign that to variable C. Here, I'm setting up the signer by using account transaction signer, and then I'm going to set up an atomic transaction composer so that we can start interacting. Here, I'm getting the suggested parameters um, from the algorithm client. And finally, we interact with the, with the calculator. Here, um, we're calling, um, we're adding the method to the atomic transaction composer. We get the method from this app this smart contract, and we get the method by name, subtract. And then um, we have this address that's calling it. This is the suggested parameters. This is the signer of the address that's calling this method. And these are the method arguments, two and one. And the rest is the same, and you're just calling the different uh, methods inside of this uh, calculator app. Then down here, we're gonna execute the uh, atomic transaction composer and get the response and we're gonna print that method out, uh, execution out. And if we run that, I, I pre-ran this code, we see that um, the, uh, the app ID that was just created is 43. And these are the results of the four uh, calculator uh, function calls. Where we subtract this one because we, the argument was two and one, so two minus one is one. So remember this is one, two, three, four. Okay, so just a quick recap, just to interact with this simple calculator app, there were a lot of setting up to do and a lot of uh, manually defining helper fun uh, functions um, to get to the deployment interaction part. All right, now let's take a look at how you do the exact same thing with Beaker. So inside of the Beaker folder, you can see there's only one file, so that's a good sign. <laughs> so here I have it. A shortened compressor, you can see the whole picture, but this right here in line eight, we're defining a Python class, just like how you would define a class in Python. We're naming it calculator, and we're inheriting from an application class. I'm gonna talk about what this is later on, but right away, this is very different from what we were doing before where we had to set up the router. It's just a familiar Python class. Let's extend that. And this is it. This is the calculator smart contract defined with Beaker. No, you know, you don't need to create a router class. You don't need to uh, connect them using the router.method decorator. This is it. So these are the four functionalities of this of the calculator. And all of these have this at external decorator. This is what exposes these methods to the ABI so that it knows how to interact with it. And this is handling all of the uh, the routing that the router class was doing before. And if we extend that, and the methods are defined the same way, we're still using PyTeal here. It's just that it's a framework that makes um, building smart contract using PyTeal much easier. All right, so how do we interact with it? Remember how we had to set up a lot of helper methods and um, it, was, it was a hassle to set up um, the code. Here we just, it's very simple to set up the, uh, the testing environment. We're using the sandbox module that's provided with Beaker and, we're, we're, and we do we set up the algorithm client with this line of code, sandbox.get algorithm client, just like that. And then we also use the sandbox module to get the accounts that are live on sandbox. And I'm gonna pop one off because this get accounts method is gonna, uh, is gonna give you a list of sandbox accounts. So if I pop one off, I get, I'll get one um, sandbox account. 
then down here, I'm going to create what's called an application client, which is something new um, that, that Beaker provides. And it's truly amazing. I'll talk about it more in detail later on. Um, but we're using the client that we got before. We're, we're instantiating the calculator app like that. And then we're using the signer of the account to create this application client. Then we use the application client to create the smart contract with this one line of code. And then we and then we go into interacting with the calculator right away. We just use the app client to call the subtract method by doing calc uh, by getting it through calculator .sub, sub, um, and then the arguments are just provided like that: a set equal to two and b set equal to one. And if we run that, we get the same result for subtract is one divide two, the same result that we got before. All right, let's go back to the slide. Okay, so what was that? Let's let's do a recap of what we just saw. So we saw a, a Sunbuilt calculator app and the interaction code written with PyTeal and the algorithm SDK. And we saw that the smart contract code was unfamiliar. Router class was very unfamiliar to uh, those coming from Web2. And you had to manually define helper functions that you use later on when you're deploying and interacting in your smart contract. And the front end setup was very lengthy. While with Beaker, smart contract organization was very familiar. You just set up a Python class um, and then you just get right into um, defining your, your functionality methods. The helper methods that you had to define manually before are just defined for you. It's provided for you. You can just use it right out of the box. And it's much easier to deploy and call your smart contract. So Beaker is a framework that improves both the algorithm SDK and PyTeal, um, the smart contract aspect. So we're going to do a deep dive into Beaker now. Uh, these are the components that Beaker provides. Uh, for the smart contract, it provides these three components. For deploying and interacting with the smart contract, it provides the application client. And for testing, it provides sandbox module that provides functionalities uh, so that it's very easy to interact and use sandbox. Before we do that, let's take a quick look at how you would set up a developer environment if, you're, if you want to build your application using Beaker. So these are the packages that you have to install. You, have, you need to have a sandbox to take, so that you can run a, a local private network on your machine when you're developing and testing your code. We need to have PyTeal and Python SDK installed so that you can um, build your smart contract and interact with it. And you have to install Beaker um, to get the framework. Now, to make that easier, I created a, what's a, a Beaker starter kit. So take this time to please scan this code. This will take you to a, a GitHub repository named Beaker starter kit. It's going to have two, uh, two folders, one saying completed code and another saying starter kit. Complete code is going to have the complete code of everything that you see in this presentation. And the starter kit folder will have the exact same files but those files will be missing some code. So those you will have to fill in the blank and, and implement them yourselves. So code by learning, learn by coding. Um, but uh, this presentation is not designed for you to do it while, uh, to code while you're watching the presentation. So please uh, pay attention to me for this presentation now and then you can go back to the, the repo uh, GitHub repository afterwards. But to quickly talk about how you would set up the development environment so that you can start coding and, and, and building, you would want to first um, launch Sandbox so that you can have the network uh, private network running on your machine. Uh, clone the GitHub repository. Go into your um, directory, uh, your project directory, and create a virtual environment so that you can have a clean slate environment. And you can activate that with that code over there. And then you can install all the required packages that I mentioned in the previous slide by just doing pip install dash r requirements.txt. The requirements.txt file will have all of the packages that you need for building a Beaker application. Great. <clears throat> all right, let's, talk, let's dive deeper into the Beaker. Let's, and we're going to first talk about the smart contract aspect of Beaker. So application class. This is a simple smart contract written with Beaker. And all it does is that it, it 
it outputs hello with whatever you provide uh, in, as an argument. So if, if I call this, I would put it, my name as the argument Chris, and it would output hello Chris. But that's not what you what I want you to focus on. I want you to focus on this right here. So here inside of the parentheses, what you're when you um, we're, what we're doing is we're inheriting from this application class. But what is this? So application class is a base class that all beaker applications should inherit from. And the reason what uh, reason why you should do that is because the application class include all of these logics. It, it lets you detect state variables, um, on complete method methods, ABI methods, and internal subroutines. Um, so what I mean by that is application class is what lets you um, write smart contract uh, in a simple way because it abstracts away all the complexity for you so that you can just focus on implementing the business logic and, and making it look very organized and clean. Okay, let's talk about state now. So in on algorithm smart contracts, there are two states, um, global and local state. Right? Global state is what lives on the smart contract that everyone can access, and local state is a state that lives on each individual account. Now, but on Beaker, uh, global state is called application state. Um, application state, global state, they're the same thing. So don't, don't get confused. <laughs> but before I start talking about the states, I do want you to focus on this line of code right here. We're using the final typing construct here. And the reason why we're doing that is because we want to prevent reassigning of these state variable names. So this is just a good practice. It's not mandatory, but we highly recommend that you do this so that you can uh, reduce the possibility of, um, of having bugs by reassigning these variables. All right, let's talk about uh, the, the application state. So this is how you would define an application state on Beaker. So the application state has th five characteristics which are the stack type, key, default, static, and the description. And if you look at the code, the, um, we see that stack type is equal to teal type dot bytes. That means that this application state has a byte value and that's all it can do. You cannot assign a, a UN64 type here. Um, and we, we see that default is set equal to bytes. This value is immutable. So that means that this, um, state has a default value. So when your smart contract is deployed and initialized, this state value, um, state will have that, um, this value is immutable byte value. We also see that static is equal to true. That means that this state is immutable. You cannot reassign this um, state. And we, we have a description explaining what this state is doing. Now, what's great about this is that this makes this um, exposes the state that you define for this mark uh, for uh, the, the the state that you define and expose it to the ABI in a very organized way. So this is what it looks like on the ABI. We see that it's a global state and it's declared, and the name of the state is declared app value, and it has the type this type this key and the description. So so your front end will have an, an easier time knowing what this state is and how you interact with it. There's also a different application state on Beaker, which is called a dynamic application state. A dynamic application state is, is a dictionary-like um, state value where it can contain multiple key value pairs. So dynamic application state can ha uh, have four state characteristics, which are stack type, max keys, key gen, and description. And if you look at the code, we see that stack type is set equal to teal type dot UN64. So the value um, in this dynamic application state will have to be a UN64. And we see that max keys is set equal to 32. That means that the maximum number of key value pairs that can be stored inside of this dynamic application state is 32. And the description explaining what this state is doing. And just like before, this is exposed to the ABI like that so that the front end knows the type and the, the amount of um, keys that um, key value pairs it can have and the description. Okay, let's talk about local state now. 
local state is called account state on Beaker. They're the same thing. But I'm going to refer to local state as account state from now on. Just like application state, same thing with account state. It has the same five characteristics and you define an account state the same way you would define an application state. Account state also has the dynamic account state. Same thing, it's a, uh, it's a dictionary like type and uh, a state and it, can, it has four same characteristics and you define it the same way as you would with a dynamic application state. All right, let's move on and talk about decorators. There are three types of decorators on Beaker. External decorator is what exposes the method as an ABI method. So this is what um, does handles all of the routing um, that the router class does with bare PyTeal. And this is how the, the ABI knows what arguments this method takes in, what output, um, what um, this method outputs and, and, and what it does. And we have the internal decorator here. So internal, well, the method with the internal decorator are methods that are used internally in the contract and they are not exposed to the ABI. Um, and these internal methods can access the state variables that you find in the smart contracts. So you can you can you can use it for defining complex um, computations or or functionalities that are used repeatedly in your smart contract. And then we have the incomplete externals, or it's also known as bare calls that, that you learned before. And there are six types of incomplete externals: create, opt-in, delete, update, clear state, and close out. All three of these decorators support authorization to only allow certain accounts to execute the method. So it can handle um, those conditioning of who can call this method and who cannot. Okay, let's dive deeper into each of the decorators to see what I mean. Okay, now first we're gonna talk about the external decorator. Here we have a method add, just like we saw before, and we ha it has the external decorator. So this external decorator is exposing this add method to the ABI and is handling all the routing so that um, the front end knows what, what the smart contract knows when to call this method. And basically this external is, mag is like magic. It, it abstracts away the router class that you saw before and it just does it for you. So you don't have to worry about you know, connecting to the router and all that. All right, we have the internal decorator. Um, here we're doing the same thing. We're, we're doing the add, uh, we're doing add, but we're gonna use the internal method to do the actual computation. The internal method here, um, we see that the method has the in, at internal decorator and then inside of the parentheses, it says teal type dot UN64. What that means is that this internal method is returning a teal type UN64. And this is saying that this method right here is not exposed to the ABI. So if you look at the ABI, it won't have this method in there. But how do you use this internal method? You would use it like that. So you would reference this internal add method by doing self.internal add, just like how you would do with, a, with Python classes. Um, and then you just take in the A, uh, A and B arguments that you put in with the add with add with internal method, and that's how you do it. So internal methods are great when you wanna implement a functionality that is used repeatedly or that is complex. Okay, the last decorator is the incomplete externals. Here I'm showing you uh, two incomplete external decorators, at create and at delete. So at create decorator is just saying that, hey, if the oncomplete application call is a create transaction, then you call this method. If the oncomplete application call is a delete transaction, then you call the delete method right there. So just want to do a quick reminder that there are six available oncomplete externals and you can define the methods um, with you by using these decorators. Now we see something new here. We see authorize set equal to authorize.only global.creator address. So this is the authorization that I was talking about before. So this delete method right here is only authorized to be called by the 
creator of the smart contract. So if let's say someone who didn't create the smart contract calls uh, an application delete transaction and calls this method, then it will fail. You can also authorize accounts that hold certain tokens, and you can also authorize accounts that are opted in to the smart contract. You can also define your own custom logic, uh, authorization logic, uh, if you want to um, make your authorization more um, fit to your need. Okay, so that was a lot of content. So let's do a quick recap. You know, for the smart contract part of Beaker, it has the application class, and the application class is the base class that all Beaker applications inherit from, and it provides the basic functionalities that abstracts away the complexity for you. Uh, the state module had um, the application state is set is is equal to global state. Local state is reference is called account state in in Beaker, and these state are exposed to the API in an organized way. And then we have the decorators. Uh, at external, at internal, and the incomplete externals, and all three of these decorators support authorization. Okay, let's, now let's talk about deploying and interacting smart contract using Beaker. These two modules right here, application client and the sandbox module are used when you're deploying and testing your code. Let's talk about sandbox first. So here, this code here is showing you what sandbox um, what helper functions sandbox module provides. Let's look at the first one here. When we do sandbox.get accounts, it's going to give you a list of sandbox account objects. And a sandbox account objects are uh, is a is a is an object that contains the address, the private key, and the signer of the account. And if you look in the middle, if you print out the accounts. Um, this is the list of a sandbox accounts object that you see that you get, and there are three provided over here. Now let's pop one off and, and access the three characteristics of the sandbox account. And we see that you can get the address, private key, and the signer. So this is how you would use these values when you're deploying and interacting, testing your uh, code. All right, here we're doing sandbox.get algoD client. So that is just going to set up the algoD client so that you can interact with your 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 um your network that's that with the sandbox configuration. So it's going to automatically defect detect the your sandbox configuration so it will know what network that you're using and it will set up the client so that you can interact with it. And just to show you what you can do with it, I'm using client to get the suggested parameters. And if I if I get if I do sp.min fee, it's going to print out the suggested fee of the algorithm blockchain, which is 1,000 micro algos. All right, now let's move on to application client. This is my favorite part of Beaker, um, but let's take a look at what we're doing here. So we're using Sandbox just like before to get the accounts and get the algorithm client so that we can start interacting and deploying the smart contract. And then we're going to use that, use those um, values to create what's called an application client. So what is an application client? The application client is a, is, a, is a tool that lets you interact with your smart contract in a convenient way. And it, it, it has over 20 helper functions defined for you so that you don't have to manually define them. So if you look at the definition of, of the application client, these are all of the methods that are just provided for you so, you, so that you can just use them. And you don't have to manually set them up. And I counted the lines of code, and you'll be saving about 700, 750 lines of code if you're using the application client. So here, this is an example of using the application client to create and to interact with a smart contract. I highlighted the lines of code where we use the app client, and let's see what they're doing. So we're using the app client to create the smart contract or deploy the smart contract. We're using the app client to fund the smart contract. Uh, we're using the app client to opt in to the smart contract. We can also call the smart contract with the app client. You can also get application account info and you can close out and delete using the application client with all one line of code. No more manually creating transactions, signing them, submitting them to the blockchain and waiting for confirmation. The application client handles it for you. 
It's really, uh, really amazing what it's doing. Let's do a recap of those two modules. The Sandbox module is a tool that easily lets you set up a testing environment and provides helper methods that um, create Audi client and get list of Sandbox accounts, and it does more. And the application client provides over 20 helper methods that you can leverage to easily interact and deploy your smart contract. So that's it. We just talked about everything about Beaker. I, and now I want to take a look at some code um, that uses everything that we learned today to build a complete RSVP application. So this RSVP smart contract has these features. It, le it lets the creator to create the RSVP event. Um, it lets the guests to RSVP to the event, check into the event. The guests can also request refunds if they decide to change their plans. Um, it also lets the creator of the smart uh, contract to withdraw all the funds collected. And it also lets the creator to delete the event after the event is done. All right, so let's look at the code. Before we do that, I just want to quickly show you that I have Sandbox running on my local machine. So I have a private network running on my machine so that I can use that to, to deploy my smart contract and, and test it. So this is what, uh, what you would do when you're building your application on, on, on Algorand. Okay, let's look at the code now. <clears throat> We're gonna first look at this, uh, the RSVP smart contract. Um, here, I'm importing in the, the final typing construct, PyTeal, Beaker um, to, use, to use them. Uh, here, um, we're setting up the class, just like how you would um, set up a Python class. This is how you would uh, set up a, a Beaker smart contract. I'm naming it event RSVP, and I'm inheriting from the application uh, base class. All right, let's expand that and let's look at the code. Here we're defining three states, two application states and one account state. The price application state is defining the price of the event. And we see that the default value is set equal to 1 million and that's specifying one algo because 1 million micro algos is one algo. And we see that the stack type is set equal to UN64 um, so it's saying that this state contains a number value. Okay, the RSVP application state is also a UN64 type and the default value is set equal to zero. And if you look at this description, it's saying that it's giving you the number of people who RSVP to the event. We also have the checked in state, but this is an account state. So this is specific to each account. The stack type is set equal to UN64, and the default value is set equal to zero. And if you look at the description, when the value is zero, it's saying that, okay, this account is not checked in to the event. And if it's one, it's saying that it's checked in to the event. Here I'm defining some constants to use later on. I'm setting min val equal to int uh, 100,000 to, uh, to specify the minimum balance and then the fee to uh, fee as 1000, which is the minimum transaction fee on Algorand. Okay, and then we have here a, a create method with a create decorator on it. So this method is gonna be called when the oncomplete application call is a tr create application create transaction. It takes in one argument, event price, which is a UN64 type. And all it's doing is it's going to initialize the application state, and then it's going to set the price value as the event price that we passed in as an argument. And, and you can see how you were referencing the price state by doing self.price, just, just like how you would access a, a, a class variable on Python. Here we have an opt-in uh, function called do RSVP. So this method is gonna be called when the application uh, transaction is an opt-in call. It takes in one argument, a payment uh, transaction type. And what it's doing is it's, it's do returning a sequence where we're asserting that the global group size is equal to two. So that's saying, hey, is the atomic transaction um, that contains the application transaction call that calls this method, does it have two transactions? Now, the reason for this is when 
the guests are RSVPing to the event, they're also paying the smart contract um, to, to register for the event. So it has to have the payment transaction and the application call all inside of that atomic transaction. Here, we're, um, we're also asserting that the receiver of this payment is self.address, this smart contract, and the amount of the payment is the price of the event. So if all of these um, is true, then we initialize the account state, and then we increment the RSVP value by doing self.rsvp.increment. Okay, moving on, we have, a we have the check-in uh, method. This is an external method, and it's only authorizing uh, the accounts that are opted in to this uh, smart contract. The reason why I have this is because you only want the accounts that, that RSVP to the event to check into the event. So that's why I'm only allowing the accounts that are opted into the smart contract to call this check-in method. And all it's doing is it's going to, it's going to assign, uh, change the checked-in account state to one. So that's specifying that this account, this person is checked into the event. Okay, down here we have an internal method called withdraw funds. And this is a helper method that withdraws funds from the RSVP contract. Here we're getting the balance of the smart contract by doing balance self.address uh, and assigning that to uh, RSVP bow variable. Here we're gonna assert that the, R the balance of the RSVP application is greater then the sum of minimum balance and the fee. The reason why I do that is because this smart contract always has to cover the minimum balance. Um, you can never go below it or else it will cause an error. But if the RSVP balance is greater than the summation of minimum balance and the fee to cover transactions later on, that means there's funds that the, create, uh, the, the event creator can withdraw. So if that's true, we're gonna create an inner transaction. And and um, the code that you saw before uses um, does in a transaction by by starting it and then and then adding it and then executing it. But here, if you, if the inner transaction contains only one transaction, you can just do it like this, where you just do inner transaction builder dot execute. And <clears throat> if you look over here, we're saying that the, this transaction is a payment transaction. The receiver of this tra uh, transaction will be the transaction sender and that uh, the amount of this transaction will be RSVP balance minus the minimum balance plus the fee so that we can always leave um, enough algos inside of the smart contract to cover the minimum balance and, and, and the transaction fee. Okay, so we have a, now we have an, an external withdrawal method that authorizes only the smart contract creator to call it. And all it's doing is, is calling the withdrawal funds internal method by doing self dot withdrawal funds. So this is what the front end, uh, the smart contract uh, account, I mean, the creator account will call to withdraw the funds. Here we have a delete method with a delete decorator. And this it also authorizes only the creator of the smart contract to call it. And this is doing something interesting. So here we have a conditioning and we check whether the balance of the smart contract is greater than the minimum summation of minimum balance and the fee. And if that's true, that means there are funds that the, the creator should withdraw before they delete the smart contract. So if that's true, then we're gonna call the withdrawal funds internal method. So this is a great example where you would wanna use an internal method. You can see that the withdrawal funds in internal method is called both in the withdrawal external method and the delete method in these two places. So by having one internal method that handles the actual function of withdrawing the funds, you can just use them repeatedly in two different external methods like that. Finally, we have the refund method. And here we see something new. We have a bare external decorator. Now this decorator is just like an, another uncomplete external decorator, but this is used when you wanna have, um, when you wanna call this method for multiple um, uncomplete calls. So here we're saying that, hey, if the, if the uncomplete application call is either a closeout transaction or a clear state transaction, you want to call this refund method. So that's when you use uh, the bare external decorator. 
and this refund method, all it's doing, it is gonna it's gonna refund the payment that the guests paid if they wanna uh, cancel the RSVP, and it's creating an inner transaction builder by doing inner transaction builder dot begin. This is familiar with what you saw before. Uh, I just want to show you two different ways of doing an inner transaction. So you begin it, you set the fields saying that the transaction is a payment type, the receiver is a transaction sender, and the amount is the price of the event, self.price minus the fee. The reason why I do minus the fee is because I want the uh, guests to pay for the cover the transaction because they're they're canceling it, so they should be paying it. Um, then we execute the inner transaction by doing inner transaction builder submit. And we're going to decrement the RSVP application state because this person is no longer coming to the event. All right, down here we have two read methods. So this is something new again. Um, for these read methods, it has the read only set equal to true. So what that's saying is that this method right here doesn't have any side effects. So when you call this um, method, it's not going to change the state of the smart contract or the blockchain. It's just going to read the value of the smart contract or state on the smart contract. So here we are authorizing only the creator of the smart contract to call this. And this is just going to read the RSVP application state value. And we have a read price, uh, read only method here that's going to read out the uh, price application state. So that's the RSVP smart contract with mid Beaker. That's all it's doing. And down here, I'm just going to write out the, the, the ABI file, the approval teal program, and the clear teal program to the file system so that you can reference it later on. And just to quickly look at them, this is the auto-generated approval teal program um, from Beaker. That, that. This is a clear program that is, um, that is also auto-generated. And this is the ABI um, that is auto-generated by Beaker. All right, now that we looked at how you create the smart contract, let's see how we deploy and interact with it. And here we're gonna use the Python algorithm SDK, but we're also gonna use the Beaker framework to make the interaction code much simpler. So we're gonna import in the algo SDK and Beaker, and I'm also, um, importing in the event RSVP um, smart contract. Just like always, we start by setting up the Algo client and getting the accounts using Sandbox. And we're gonna pop three accounts off and assign them to each uh, variables uh, so that we can use them. <clears throat> so what, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go through three scenarios. The first scenario is guest one, um, RSVPing to the event, and then checking into the event, just like a normal guest would do. Scenario two, guest two is going to RSVP to the event, but decides to get, get a refund and cancel the RSVP. Scenario three is when the creator of the event RSVP uh, is going to withdraw the funds and, close, uh, and delete the smart contract. All right, let's see how we do that. First, we're gonna get the instance of the event RSVP smart contract. Since it's a Python class, you can instantiate it. And then we're gonna use that to set up the application client for the event creator. As you can see that we are using the creator account signer uh, for this application client. And you also pass in the algorithm client and the instance of the smart contract that you wanna interact with. And I'm gonna set that equal to app client. Okay, let's now go into the deployment part. We're, here, we're gonna deploy the smart contract. So here I'm getting the suggested parameters from the algorithm client, and then I'm gonna create the event RSVP smart contract with this line of code here, where I pass in event price that equal to one algo. And it's, that's going to return the app ID, the app address, and the transaction ID. And I'm gonna print that out later here. I'll show you what these, um, these print out later on uh, for time purposes. Then here we're gonna call the, uh, the smart contract to read the price application state just to see, just to check that it was properly assigned. Down here, I'm gonna fund the smart contract to cover the minimum balance. Then now we're gonna go into scenario one. 
Here, I'm going to set up a different, another application client for guest one. And here we're doing it by doing, uh, doing app, app client dot prepare. So this prepare is exactly the same as before, but what it's doing is a shortcut for setting up a different application client. Um, um, and it just takes in the same algorithm client and the same smart contract I used before. And all you have to pass in is the signer of the new account that this application is for, uh, for uh, app client is for. So I'm going to assign that to app client guest one. And here, now we're going to, uh, guest one is going to RSVP to the event. And to do that, uh, since when you're RSVPing to the event, you have to pay uh, um, to register, we're going to create a, a payment transaction. And here we're creating a transaction with signer. And then we're uh, putting transactions that equal to the payment transaction where the guest one address is calling it, is, is sending the transaction and the amount is one algo. Then we're gonna opt in to the smart contract with this line of code here. And we're gonna pass in the payment uh, transaction object that we defined above. So what this is doing here is when um, the, the, when guest one is opting into the smart contract is automatically putting this payment transaction object into an atomic transfer at atomic transaction and it's going to execute that. So this is also done with Beaker so that you don't have to worry about setting up an atomic transaction. Then we're going to get the account state of guest one and we're going to check the checked in uh, local state or also known as um, account state in Beaker. And since they haven't checked into the event yet, the checked in value should be zero. Okay, then now guess one is going to check into the event by calling the check-in method in a smart contract. And now if we get the account state, the check-in value should be one. And we're gonna also call the read RSVP method here to check if the RSVP count went up properly. All right, moving on to scenario two. Again, same thing. We're gonna set up a, a separate application client for guest two like that. And then we're gonna RSVP to the event just like how we did with guest one. So we created a payment transaction object here, and then we're gonna opt into the smart contract by passing in the payment transaction. And if you get the accounts, they, the check-in value should be zero. We're doing the same thing. Okay, coming down over here. Now, guest two decides, hey, I don't wanna to go to this event. I'm just gonna stay home, watch Netflix. Um, then uh, guest one, guest two is going to cancel the registration by call uh, doing um, app client guest to dot close out. So a cloud close out application call is basically, hey, I want to erase my uh, account state and just opt out of this smart contract. And because we routed the refund method to the close out on complete application call, um, when the guest when guest two closes out, it's going to call the refund method and it's going to refund um, the, um, the, the, the event price um, to, the, to guest two. And if guest two calls get account state, since they've already erased their account state, it should cause an error. That's why I'm doing a try and accept here. And then if you read the RSVP um, application state, it should have went down to one from two. All right, last scenario, we're gonna withdraw and delete the smart contract. Uh, so event creator is going to withdraw all of the funds that are locked in the smart contract by calling the withdraw external method. And here we're just gonna check the uh, balance of the RSVP app to see if it was properly withdrawn. And then we're gonna finally delete this, the event RSVP smart contract. So if we run that, this is what you, you will see. I so I just quickly go through what we are seeing here. Uh, when we deploy the smart contract, we see that okay, the app has an ID forty eight. The address of the ad, uh, application is this, and the transaction ID is that. And event price is set to one million microalgos. Perfect. That's what we want. And and since we funded the uh, smart contract to cover the minimum balance, we see that the RSVP balance is set equal to 100,000 microalgos. All right, moving on to scenario one, 
guest one is going to RSVP to the event. And um, when they RSVP, they ha now have a checked in account state. And when we see that, when we uh, see the value of the checked in value, um, it's zero, just like how we want it to be. And since they paid 1 million micro algos to RSVP to the event, the balance of the RSVP app is now 1 million. Um, um, this value right here, because it, it's the 1 million micro algos plus the um, minimum balance. Guess one is going to check into the event, and now the checked in value is one, and the number of people RSVP is one. So everything's working perfectly. Uh, guess two, same thing, RSVP to the event, checking the balance and checking the number of people RSVP. And then guess two, cancel the registration and close out. Um, we see that the RSVP number went down to one from two, and the RSVP balance also went down as well. And when the event creator withdraws and delete the smart contract, we see that everything works perfectly, and the RSVP smart contract is left with uh, this um, 100,000 microalgos to cover the minimum balance. And then the event creator deletes the uh, RSVP contract. All right. Going back to the slides. So what, what did we learn today? Let's do a quick recap because that was a lot of things that we just talked about. We first saw uh, what an algorithm DAP architecture looks like to, and we compared it with a, a familiar Web2 app architecture to see where smart contracts in the algorithm SDK fit in in, um, in terms of the full application. Then we took a deep dive into Beaker. We learned what it is, what it does, and how you do it, um, and why it's so amazing. And then we took a look at a we looked at a complete RSVP example that utilizes everything that we learned about Beaker today to see um, how you would actually build a Beaker application. So, if there's one thing that I want you to take away from this presentation, if you don't remember anything, is that Beaker is really amazing. Um, it really makes um, building your smart contract and interacting with it, very easy, very familiar uh, for anyone who is familiar with Python. That's everything I have. Um, so please do scan this uh, QR code here. This is uh, all in one uh, re uh, resources that Algorand developers will need. It will also contain the slides of this uh, presentation and the GitHub repository, the calculator repository and the starter kit in there as well. And if you want to, you can just, uh, if you, you can scan this QR code on the right here, this is my personal um, information. Uh, it, it contains how information on how you can connect with me. Um, I wanna share this because I wanna help you guys. I want you guys to um, ask questions, reach out to me if you ever stuck. So give this a scan to uh, learn how you can connect with me. Um, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Chris. You have uh, some questions that you can answer live if you want. All right. Okay, let's see. Uh, we have a question, how to get access to all these sample code? Uh, great question. So if you can scan this QR code on the left, um, this will have all of the slide, uh, sli have the slide deck and it'll have the two, two GitHub repositories that contain all of the code that I showed today. So that's where you see it. All right, next question. Is there any is there any reason to prefer the previous methods to Beaker? Um, uh, that's a great question. So I think it's really it based is depends on your preference. Do you do, do you prefer building uh, smart contracts on Algorand with something familiar to you, where the complexity is abstracted away from you? Or do you want to get your hands dirty and, and, and really dive into um, bare PyTeal and, and customize your code um, to, your, to your need? Um, so I think, I think Beaker definitely makes it simpler and easier. But if you, if you want to you know, really go crazy on um, PyTeal, then you can just use PyTeal. All right, next question. Can at external decorator and at internal decorator be compared with external and internal keyword used in Solidity? Um, that's a great question. Yes, exactly. Um, so for Solidity, 
if I remember correctly, because I've uh, haven't coded in Solidity for years, but Solidity also has the external internal keywords and and is basically doing the same thing. The external decorator is what exposes the method to the front end, so they, so they can call it, interact with it, and the internal methods are just for in, for internal purposes only. So, yes, I think it would be fair to think of it that way. Okay, next question: Do we need to create and delete? the smart contract every time we want to interact with it. I mean, we can load it from the chain whenever we want to interact with it and then just close the app. Uh, great question. So no, you don't have to create and delete the smart contract every time you want to interact with it. The reason why I did it that way was, was for demonstration purpose only. And I, I just, and I just want to, um, because for that scenario, you would want to create that event RSVP smart contract when you're having an event. And when the event is over, you don't you can just delete that smart contract because you don't need it anymore. So that's why I did it that way. You don't need to delete your smart contract every time you interact with it. Actually, most smart contracts would never get deleted because you just you would use it repeatedly for your application. All right, next question. Will Beaker be integrated into the newly announced algo kit or will it remain as a separate framework? Um I can't give you a, a clear answer right now because I think that's still in discussion. But to my knowledge, yes, Beaker is going to be included in, in, in AlgoKit. I think that's what um, John uh, said. But don't take my word for it. Uh, AlgoKit is still in development and uh, I, I guess we'll see what happens. Okay, perhaps a last question. Uh... If none of the students uh, wants to ask a question, I have one. What about okay. uh, ver verification? Do you think that uh, Beaker would be easier to statically analyze than uh, plain uh, PyTeal? Mm. Good question. So Beaker doesn't um, let you escape from learning PyTeal because it still uses PyTeal, right? It's just that when you're building your smart contract, the way you organize your code is just much simpler and familiar. That's all it's doing. It's not completely getting rid of PyTeal. So when you're defining those methods, you're still using PyTeal the same way you would um, by with just building uh, smart contracts with bare PyTeal. Um, so for those just starting off, I actually do recommend using Beaker because, because when you're just starting off, you you there's so many things that you have to consider. Like I remember when I was learning, I was just I okay, so I I I learned how you would do certain things using PyTeal, but then the problem came, okay, where do I put this? How, or how do I structure my smart contract? How does it, how do I make it, how do I make it work? Um, and it took me a while to really figure that out. But if you use Beaker, it's very straightforward. You just define a Python class, you, in, in, you inherit from the application base class, and then you just go straight into defining your state and your, your methods, your functionalities. So, so I think, I think you can really focus on implementing what, um, what you want your smart contract to do rather than worrying about how to actually make it work. So yes, I recommend the, using it. Is the documentation of Beaker ready to be used uh, from external developers? Is the documentation ready? Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, so there is a documentation. So if you scan the QR code on the left, it will have direct you to the Beaker documentation and also uh, Beaker GitHub repository. So um, I definitely recommend taking a look at the documentation because I did not cover everything, every single detail of Beaker today. Um, so look, if you just have that documentation on your screen when you're building your application, it will just really help you. Okay. And also, also one recommendation is there's, you can also, you should also look at the Beaker GitHub repository because it has an examples folder. And inside of that has a bunch of examples where um, you use Beaker to create different smart contracts. I definitely 
reference that a lot when I was learning Beaker to see how you would actually do things with Beaker. Yeah. Okay. For our students, uh, please consider Beaker for your projects. Okay. So thank you very much, Chris. Awesome, awesome. presentation. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you.